When you know what you want for the future, you need the present to line up with your goals. UCF Online offers more than 100 fully online programs in healthcare, engineering, criminal justice, and more, so you can get to your future and beyond. From the University of Louisville's Delphi Center for Teaching and Learning, and the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning. I am Kelvin Thompson. And I am Tom Cavanaugh. And you are listening to TopCast, the Teaching Online podcast. Hey, Tom. Everyone's favorite podcast. Hello, Kelvin. Well, I mean, if it isn't, it probably should be. That's right. Look, I'll put it right up there on the list of favorites, um, my list. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Maybe my mom's list, if she ever listened to a podcast. Yeah. If she knew what a podcast was. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I listen to it, but, you know, I, I kind of have to because we, <laughs> <laughs> we have to say, what did we say? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I'll be honest here. I've heard worse. <laughs> yeah, well, true. If that's our standard, yes. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah. You know, there's worse stuff out there that you all could be listening to. So, aren't you? We're sparing you. Aren't you glad you're listening to this one instead? Uh, yes. And speaking of listening to this uh, podcast and uh, helping us out. Uh, not that we don't already appreciate you, dear listener, just listening, but we want to ask you to do a little bit more. If you would just insert a dollar bill into your... No, that's not. That's not. Not that kind of helping us out. We really would appreciate you helping us crowdsource the topic for our upcoming recorded live episode of TopCast that will be at the Online Learning Consortium's Accelerate 2023 conference uh, in fall 2023. So now... Right now, as you're listening to this, that would be the time to do this. So I'm going to give you just a little brief URL and uh, just pause the recording, like write this thing down, go fill out the little, it'll take you like 10 seconds or something, poll, and then come right back and hit play again. It'd be easy. So here comes the URL. It's bit.ly slash vote underscore TopCast Live 2023. That's bit.ly, B-I-T slash vote, V-O-T-E, underscore, topcast, live, 2023, all lowercase, no spaces. We'd appreciate it. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you out there. All right, so Kevin, I see you sipping. I've got a cup of uh, Gorilla Decaf here in my Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University mug, my former institution. Gorilla, Gorilla Decaf. Gorilla decaf, yeah. When you started saying gorilla, I was worried what was going to follow that in uh, <laughs> in the mug there, but uh, I'm glad it's gorilla decaf. I um, I've already been judged and harassed on this uh, prior to our recording, but I'm holding in my hand, Tom, as you might be able to see, a cup of um, I don't know. Do I call it up by name? I guess so. A cup of Starbucks. Uh, yeah, and well, if somebody's watching, it's obvious because of the logo. Yes. Yes. Um, so here's why and my attempt at a connection to today's topic. Um, you know, awfully hard to be critical of something uh, from the sidelines without getting involved at all. So... I could make my comments about Starbucks all day long and possibly have at times. Uh, but, you know, can I really in good conscience do that if I don't periodically actually sample their brew? No, I shouldn't be doing that. But now that I've had a cup, I feel like I can make comments, which I won't in this particular episode, uh, but if you're interested, send me a note. I'll be happy to tell you what I, what I think. But so this is a cup of Pike's Place Starbucks, and that's my attempt at a connection. Do you have a connection <laughs> to today's episode topic? Uh, I do not, but I think I get your connection. Okay, do tell. So, um, like, you, you can't, you, you cannot criticize from the sidelines you know, I think there's like a Teddy Roosevelt quote somewhere that 
you know, you have to be a, a you know a man in the fray or something like that. In the arena, he says. In the, in the arena, arena, that's it. Yeah, yeah, in man arena. in the arena. And so, if you're gonna throw stones, you might as well get in there and <laughs> get hit. Get get a few rocks in the face yourself. Yeah. Um, and for what it's worth, I like Starbucks, but I don't have your refined coffee palate. Uh, I don't so. know that I have my refined coffee palate, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I, yeah, I think I think um, I think that's that's um, relevant to today's discussion um, because we're back at it again, talking about everyone's favorite subject of artificial intelligence, which mm -hmm. is something of a mini theme for us this month. Yeah, we had uh, the top of the month. Uh, we had a you and me talking about current updates around uh, AI, especially generative AI in uh, higher education. And uh, here we are at the middle of the month with our guest interview-based episode, picking up that theme again. So, Tom, you recently interviewed our colleague, Dr. Rohan Jawala. Dr. Jawala is currently a senior instructional designer at UCF's Center for Distributed Learning. And relevant to your conversation, I think, and you kind of make a passing oblique mention of this once or twice, he maintains an active YouTube channel where he shares his research interests and educational insights with you know, over 2,500 subscribers and more than 200 plus videos. And Dr. Jawala holds an EDD in language and literacy in education from the University of Sheffield. He'll, you'll notice he'll talk about language a little bit. And he holds uh, an MED in special needs and inclusion studies from the Open University and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from the Open University uh, as well. Is there anything you might like to say about the interview before we cut to it? Uh, just that I always enjoy talking to Rohan, and although I see him in the office all the time, I don't often take the opportunity to sit down at some length and have just a conversation like this. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated the opportunity. He's a super thoughtful guy, and he's been thinking about AI long before ChatGPT hit the scenes um, last fall. Mm -hmm. So he's he's got a kind of a, a depth of knowledge that I think probably exceeds that of a lot of people who kind of are just really recent to this new mm -hmm. phenomenon, which I think gives him an interesting perspective that's informed by, by more than just yesterday's or today's headlines. Yeah, well said. Through the modern technological marvel that is podcast time travel, here is your interview with Dr. Rohan Jawala. So, Rohan, thank you so much for being on TopCast. Thank you for having me, Sir Tom. Yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it's kind of an odd context because you and I have conversations in the office all the time. But um, you are someone that I've been wanting to get on the show for a while because you've been so deeply embedded in artificial intelligence even well before ChatGPT sort of broke publicly onto the scene, you know, not quite a year ago, but back in last fall, um, this was something that I don't think surprised you at all, because you had been, you know, researching and uh, exploring, experimenting with some of these various <laughs> tools for a while before that. So really, that kind of leads into my first question, which is, like, what got you interested in artificial intelligence as a, as a subject of inquiry? I think it's a diversion of so many points. As a matter of fact, um, I go back to UK. When I was in the UK, roughly in 2001, I came across a program they called Success Maker. Success Maker was geared at providing computerized based instruction for students. And I was fascinated because these students were put in at a level, the computer made the adjustments, the computer was able to print sheets out for students to practice and students actually gain reading age increased rather over a period of time substantially and success maker was very expensive you know fast forward back to 2014 so i've been tracking the development fast forward to 2014 2015 i was working at ucf you were my boss then and still is <laughs> so so i came across it, we were looking at adaptive learning at that point in time, and I saw the emergence of greater algorithm coming into the system. It was not there yet. You know, it was like promises were made, but people saw the future. And if people start making promises about the future, it's time to really take, pay attention to that. So I think my love for technology started way back before even going to UK, but I've always loved to see technology advancing. 
And I saw the landscape kind of shift roughly 2016, 2017 with VR and AI emerging together. Powerful algorithms being developed, powerful enough to sway how people think, to sway how people learn, and also to influence our teaching and learning process as it relates online. So that's kind of uh, the next where, place I want to I want to dig into this idea of how people how people learn. Um, I know you've been thinking deeply about um, the the application of AI into pedagogy um, or andragogy even, and I, I wonder you know kind of what do you think the what excites you most about the possibilities of AI for impacting instruction. I think when you look at it, the possibilities are endless. You're looking at transformation of learning, transformation of teaching as it relates to students can now have personalized pathways if the AI system is developed. And when I talk about personalized pathways, I'm talking about using data to future plan for students, understanding that learning starts when the child is able to speak and tracking that child using data to personalize the learning pathway rather than for the system to predict and see what the child is doing. We can have actually have data to use in the system to make projections. I like the concept because it promises that our pathway to teaching and learning and developing of content will be enhanced tremendously. I can say to you at this point in time, we are at a stage in education, in higher education, where content, a person can write a course in less than a week you know, providing they have the background information, they have the critical prompts, they understand the readings as necessary, they could really push out a quality course that has interaction, it has that, that sort of need for that industry, specific industry. So we are going to generate content much quicker. And my issue for saying this is that there's also the issue of democratization of education. Education in the United States has been somewhat very expensive. And I want to say that having studied in UK, I actually paid, was able to pay off for my bill based on the cost back then. I don't know how it is now. But when you look at democratization, it means lowering the cost for education. So individuals won't have this extensive student loan because the content is going to be there. So the production of the content will somewhat be lowered in cost, hopefully. And I say the word hopefully because it all depends on who controls the content that is being scraped at this point in time. So when I think about that, it's going to be transformative for teaching and learning. And it's going to, we're not even see, seeing the start of it because there's more to come. With chat GPT-5 and other apps coming on, it's going to be more powerful. But I think it has a way to ensure that learners are not excluded anymore, but at pathway is planned and the use of data in ensuring this is going to be optimal. So universities are going to be seeing data as gold mines as they go forward. Democratization and personalization. Those are two key bullets in what you just said. Those are, I think those are really, really interesting points that are going to be worth watching as, as time goes on, um, you know, relative to the impact of AI. So those are all good things. But you know, the, with every every new development, there's there's good and risk, right? Um, so, what concerns you? Like, what what fears do you have? And whether they're ethical or technical or however um, you're you're looking at it, you know, what what keeps you up at night when you're when you're thinking about AI? When I think about AI, I think about the stages of AI. Right now, I would say that we're in the second or third stage. We're just inputting data, you know, we're able to get information out, we're able, to, it's a big recording, so we're able to pick from one record and put them together and make a sequence. And I think at this point, that's where we are. But what gets me having sleepless night is the inability for our lawmakers and policymakers to really consider the ethical implications if checks and balances are not placed within the framework. So. For example, we can have misinformation as it relates to, to the content that is being produced. We can have the exclusion of individual voices. As I recently found out when I asked ChatGPT to analyze the text, it stated it could not analyze the text because it was not right. But that was a historical text based on something that needed to be taught and be transferred to the next generation. So it goes both ways. There's a risk of losing 
quality information based on the boundaries set by these organizations, you, you know, the, the barriers that they set, you can't ask certain questions. And there's the ethical implications because if it le if left not being controlled, then we have a slippery slope where people can use it to create harm. You know, as I stated in a recent conversation with some individuals, language has the power to shape culture, education, religion, and everything. So if we allow the AI system to control the language base, then we have lost it totally. So the human element is going to be important. So what gets me having sleepless nights is that we have not addressed the ethical issues and that could be a detriment as it relates to education and other areas in our society. You know, it's that's something that I've been fascinated by AI, particularly ChatGPT and maybe Midjourney and Dolly and some of those other tools. Um, but it, it does feel like, to your point, like we're just on the first chapter of a very long book uh, uh, in the evolution of, of AI. But there, there are, you know, to your point also about the ethical concerns, the, the bias and misinformation that seem to be baked in, even in some of the just experimental prompts I put in there. I've had it come back and tell me, um, I can't comment on that. Yes, and it was, yes. It was political, right? I've purposely put in some provocative things about politics. But yet on the other side, like I'll put in both sides of a debate, and on one side, it's perfectly happy to make a comment, and on the other, it's not. And then, of course, the the infamous hallucinations that AI yes, has, yes, yeah. and it'll just make stuff up. And so in, until it becomes reliable, it's going to be hard to, to see um, it having kind of broader impact, but I, I don't think we're far away from that. And um, and I guess, you know, the, the, the question that sort of is begged from that is, you know, do you, how far out do you think we are in the evolution of, of some of those, those issues being addressed, especially the, the issue of hallucinations? Because once those get fixed, then, then sort of, you know, the, the, the lid is off and the, the possibilities are endless. I think when you think about that, you're thinking about language models. And I think based on how it's being developed now, where you have people contributing to the model, it's go there's go always going to be bias. So we have to think about that. I suspect as things emerge, companies and organizations will need to have their own little language model so they can interact with the content they want or they choose fit within the organizational context because it's going to be ongoing because the system right now takes in everything and is trying to sort it out at the expense of eliminating even truthfulness within the context. So we have to see there's going to be the need for greater human observation, supervision, and coordination of the data that is placed into these elements. Because without the human element, then we can't have, we can address certain things because remember in, in our conversation, regarding AI, it has no moral judgment. It's always based on what is put in. So you mentioned the human element, and you also mentioned you can build a course basically in a couple of days now, and, and, it, and it'll be good, right? Um, and you can even illustrate it with images that are AI generated and have it taught by an AI avatar, potentially even. Uh, I've seen a lot of your videos online mm -hmm. with these AI avatars and they're, they're pretty good. So how do we ensure that the human still remains kind of at the center of the educational process? I imagine f faculty who are have no shortage of paranoia at times are going to be concerned that they're going to be replaced by some sort of AI professor. I, I think that's the fear is always worth it. It's always necessary to think about and you can't deny that fear. But I think they have the capacity to even using the content they have produced to create even a better course, you know, because you can find out elements that are missing and improve that area. I think when you generate content using AI resources, you must identify these resources. If you use an avatar um, as it relates to my thoughts, as it relates to um, ethics, you need to say that this is an avatar, not a real person. And in my videos, many, many times I'll say, 
Dr. Joala is talking about X or Y because I want that content to be owned by me, not that avatar. So always personalize it within the course section that you are leading the content. As you develop that course, you have to ensure that there are issues that AI will not pick up on. I did something the other day when I talked about bullying online as it relates to early childhood education. And the avatar did not write this, but I made sure put in that if you're going through this content and you feel uncomfortable in any way, please stop because you must stop and seek help because there might be someone traumatized in that event. So we have to remember the human element cannot be excluded from this because we need that because it's just an artificial way, but we need a human element to socialize that sort of course that you're doing. Yeah, and it seems like the, the development and delivery of AI-generated content um, has its place, but it doesn't, at least yet, seem to have any sort of foothold in the sort of social aspect of education, whether that's online or in, or face-to-face. -face. It, it doesn't seem to be able to facilitate that, and you need to have a human being in the, I, I like in the professor position. I strongly believe in that because I was doing the avatars and I reached roughly session six and I couldn't be bothered with it because I'm saying to myself, it doesn't feel like me. You know, it was having my voice. So I stopped and I started recording some videos and I'm, I'm going to do that until they decide to be more realistic and more physical and more expressive, then I'll do that. But at the same time, we must say that this is an AI content um, position there rather than saying it's just an AI. We must say that this is not human. It's important to acknowledge that. Right. And maybe one other risk too that I'll maybe ask you to comment on is that if, if say a bunch of universities start using tools, I don't know, synesthesia is one, but there are a lot of them out there that can very easily create sort of transactional knowledge delivery. Um, then we're just commoditizing a lot of education, right? And then what makes a UCF education unique in comparison to other universities' education? So if, we're, if say we're all at some future point using these tools and generating AI content, it seems like there's there, there ought to be something unique and special about a UCF education that you can't get anywhere else. I, I would like to say that I think we're, we're thinking on the same line because I go back to the process of the, saying that teaching is a social construct. It's a social engagement and you can get, it's human. And you can't separate that because you want that human connection. And I strongly believe that without that human connection that by Gosky talks about the construction of knowledge, then we are moving away from it. We have to think about the future because if we think that we're going to present AI avatars as professors down the road, let us think about the implication for humanity, for interaction, for communication, and also for, for the social engagement in our society. That, is, that has great impact if we continue down the road. So we need to really balance it, but at the same time understand that human element is going to be a key factor for us to push a quality in engagement in higher education. Cool. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. And I, I wonder maybe before we go, if, if you had any advice for somebody who is just sort of getting started with AI, you know, what should they focus on? Maybe what should they avoid? Any sort of, you know, pro tip from somebody who's been doing it for years actually now? I, I would say that we'll have to start by understanding what it is all about defining, understanding the definition of what AI is. As you go further, you have to play around with a lot of tools. There are going to be some tools that are easy to use, some are complex. You might have to spend a few bucks like myself to really <laughs> follow along with it. But I think understanding the fundamentals of what AI is, understand the ethical principles of what AI should be, and engaging with content is important. Always follow individuals who are leaders in the field. I think it's so important. You know, I subscribe to so many, for example, BBC, Virtual Reality, AI. I follow a lot of people around. I read content on that. I follow, I have a lot of audiobooks, so I've embedded myself in it. But more than ever, you have to be using it. If you're not using AI you're, and you're saying you want to know more about it, you're going to be left behind. So I'm saying to everyone, 
listening, don't be left behind. Jump on the ship because the bottom line is education takes a long time to turn and we need to be on this vessel. So when it turns, we are ready for the next movement. And I think the next movement is going to even be greater than this one. Great. Well, that that's good advice. Uh, Rohan, thank you so much for being on TopCast. Well, Tom, that was your interview with Dr. Rohan Jawala. It was, yeah. Like I said, he's a thoughtful guy. I, I enjoy talking to him and, and he's really, he's up to his armpits in this AI stuff. He's really, really into it. It's true. And uh, yeah, I miss, uh, I've had many a thoughtful standing in the doorway, hanging out uh, in the hallway conversations with uh, Rohan through the years. And he is, uh, thoughtful is probably the best word, deep. Uh, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing ever surfacy about uh, Rohan's takes on anything. So this was uh, obviously well prepared. Uh, lots of, uh, lots of ground covered because of that. Uh, I think in that brief interview, um, I could go all kinds of different directions, but I, I can't not mention that he said the same words that we said in the prior episode. Right? That uh, he talked about the human element and its importance in this whole consideration. Yeah, um, I think as much as we are turning AI into an occasional theme, I think the human element is becoming a sub-theme of that theme. Mm -hmm. It keeps coming up, um, mm -hmm. as it should. I think anytime we're talking about kind of automation and mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, that, um, you know, how do we ensure that it's still humane um, mm -hmm. in its in its design and presentation. Mm -hmm. you know, I talked about this sort of transactional kind of commoditization potentially. And I, mm -hmm. and I, you know, obviously Rohan's thinking about things like that, but we want to make sure that whatever we do with AI, it, it doesn't like replace the, the mm -hmm. humanity of it. It can be yes. a tool. It can be a kind of a prosthetic uh, to make us more efficient or create thing, more things faster. But at the end of the day, it, it can't replace the human. That's right. And I noticed that when you, when you put that phrase out there, he, his, uh, his immediate response was, you know, he didn't elaborate too much, but education is social, you know, and the implication isn't just, I thought that's an interesting word, right? He didn't say interactive, right? Because you could interact with uh, a technology-based entity, right? I mean, you could it could be interactive in, at the individual level, but he said social, which to me implies a group of humans, right? Uh, that's maybe a deep philosophical construct, but I think you know, education is social is a is an interesting value statement. And we we've mentioned that before over the years on this podcast. It's it's come up. And um, I, I think it will come up again because it's one of those, mm -hmm. I think, universal truths. Um, it does, not to go down a rabbit hole, but th like you're ch that, that's challenged a little bit by like competency-based ed and mm -hmm. other kinds of things mm -hmm. that I'm mm -hmm. sort of interested in. Mm -hmm. But you could make an argument that, that there are social elements to that too. It's just a different kind of social design. It's with a mentor and a faculty member, yeah. not necessarily with other students in, in kind of real time. But that aside, um, you know, sort of back to, to Rohan and, and his thoughts, um, beyond just sort of the human element, that he did sort of like correct me a little bit. Like when I started talking about AI, because he's got so much knowledge, he started, yeah. he's like, well, you mean, you're talking about large language models and right. there are other kinds right. of AI, right. Tom. Right. You know, like, okay, yes, you are you are correct. But we have all been so immersed in this chat GPT yeah. moment that yeah. when you say AI, AI, people often kind of conflate it with that, but he's right. There's all kinds of other things. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. starting to follow now on social media. I even saw something on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. <laughs> the this, this like image that outlined all of these different AI tools. I've mm -hmm. bookmarked a page that's sort of tracking mm -hmm. on almost a daily basis, mm -hmm. new AI tools that are coming mm -hmm. in and they're mm -hmm. not all large language models. Right. No, no, that's right. That's right. I mean, certainly uh, you two talked about even some of the image generation stuff. And I mean, that would be a, 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 maybe a very clear example of something that's not a large language model. If you haven't right? seen it, you should see the art that Rohan creates with mm -hmm. Midjourney. Um, mm -hmm. 
he does in particular Caribbean art, as you might have mm -hmm. told, could tell from his accent. He's from mm -hmm. Jamaica. Um, it's spectacular the mm -hmm. the art that he he creates using AI. It's mm -hmm. I mean it's beautiful. Yeah, I I was kind of fascinated by this whole line in your conversation about content generation and uh, particularly content generation for like online course content and this kind of thought of well you could put that a course together rather quickly but I think the insinuation there were a couple of things that I heard I think but not not mindlessly right not just like you know, hit generate course and then walk away or something, right? But uh, which back to your uh, commoditization kind of comment, but starting point and then and then refine. But Rohan was very careful, one, to say, yes, there should be hum human involved in, in that. Uh, and two, to say that there should be some disclaiming, right? That, that this was, uh, and I think we're, that's an interesting, uh, I think we're still in the, the early stages of identifying effective practices and that kind of disclaiming, like when do you do that? You know, how yeah. often do you do that? Uh, I, I did a thing and I asked, you know, for some refined ideas. Do I disclaim? Right. Uh, I took a raw nugget and I completely rewrote from there. Do I disclaim? Right. I, I think those yeah. are. Those are big questions, but I thought all I think that was are. interesting. It, it is, and I think that's probably worth another conversation because, um, as you say, we don't have the rules around that, the standards mm -hmm. and practices around that. And isn't, I mean, one could make the argument that AI is just a kind of much more extreme example of Grammarly mm -hmm. or um, Spell Checker in Microsoft Word or Grammar Checker in Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. Even within Word, it mm -hmm. it predicts what you're going to type next uh, in within that sentence, and you can choose to accept that. And so, in some ways, you're it's assisting you in writing. And we don't just dis, you know disclaim that and mm -hmm. give credit to Grammarly for helping us. <laughs> I think about because you know I have sort of a hobby of writing, and I know that people use uh, like fiction writing, and people use these tools, these software platforms that help them plot and, you know, outline novels and things. I, I don't, for what it's worth, but um, <laughs> they don't claim that, right? And give mm -hmm. them co-credit uh, uh, as, as a co-author. So, like, at what point does it cross some threshold where it's only ethical to, you know, state this thing helped me, yeah. but below that threshold, it's just you know, Microsoft Word or Grammarly or something. I, I don't know if that's a clear line yet. So I'm fascinated, right? So this 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 little last moment or two that we've been talking, that's definitely the realm of morality and ethics, right? Very human stuff. Important for us to wrestle through and get to some kind of a resolution. But it puts me in mind of maybe my, maybe my favorite statement that Rohan made in the whole interview. He just kind of does this sort of this mic drop kind of thing. He says, remember, AI has no moral judgment. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, amen, brother. <laughs> that's true, yeah. Um, and in some cases, questionable moral judgment, depending upon how the prompt was phrased or what data sources it's using or what bias it may have. So yeah, that's an interesting, maybe that's a good place to, to kind of wrap up because it's, it's juicy and thought provoking and maybe, maybe can lead to some further discussions down the line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you want to get us on the runway and we'll get out yes. of here? I'm using my Embry-Riddle mug. I will <laughs> extend the aviation metaphors, put the landing gear down. So Get on board, right? Or be left behind. Um, we should all stay actively engaged in AI so that we can better understand the educational implications of the tool and adapt to it or maybe even shape new developments as they come down the pike. Uh, I, I think if we don't lean into it, we're going to, it's a, if we don't try to, to, to use a cliche, if we don't ride this wave, we're going to get washed away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think, I think that's right. 
And, uh, and you know, you can't criticize it if you're not going to get involved. Uh, right. Man in the arena. <laughs> that's right. Well, uh, Tom, as always, I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rohan Jawala, for joining us. And until next time, for TopCast, I'm Kelvin. And I'm Tom. See ya.